from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 11. Gospel according to Mark <coughs> chapter 11. Or to do harm. 
to save life or to kill. Then he asked personal questions. Instead of drawing out more information, personal questions help people to reveal their personal feelings and belief. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus asked his disciples, who people say that I am? And they answered by saying, John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus personalizes the question. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And then he raises pro provocative questions. Third kind of question that creates a conversation and a discussion and can also put people on their heels. Well, that's what we're going to see in our passage today as we consider our text found in that 11th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Here's a sentence that summarizes this section of Scripture. Those who accept Christ must live under His authority. I see three ways Jesus utilizes questions that we can put into practice as well. Previous chapter tells us that after cursing a fig tree and cleansing a temple, Jesus went back to Bethany to spend the night. Mark chapter 11 verse 27 tells us what happened the next day. He came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and scribes and elders came to him. Jesus was using the temple as a classroom to teach those seeking the truth. It was common for teachers to walk and talk as they talk. Luke chapter 20 verse 1 mentions that Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel. Yeah. Jesus had predicted earlier in that 8th chapter of Mark that these three groups of religious leaders would turn on him. He said the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. These three groups represented the 70 member of Sanhedrin court, the Jewish Supreme Court. Chief priests were the priests who made up the upper echelon, including Caiaphas, the high priest. Scribes were the lawyers, charged with interpreting the law of Moses. And it was also the duty to hand copy the scriptures. The elders were lay leaders, representatives of the major tribes and families of Israel. So we see here in verse 28 that they come with a two-part question, both old and blunt. By what authority yeah. are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority to do them? I say they don't want to know the truth of what's being taught in the temple. The question reveals that their ultimate issue of life is a thought. They want to know what is he doing? Who is it that gave him the right to do it? They're basically saying, who do you think you are? Yeah. In one sense, it's a legitimate question that was part of their job, but they were actually personally threatened by everything Jesus was doing and teaching. Uh -huh. As a preacher, I've encountered that people who think, who gives you the right to do such and such a thing? What gives you the authority? Who died and made you fall? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm here to tell you my authority is not derived from that certificate they gave me uh, when I got ordained. Yeah. My authority is not derived from the license preach that I received in my quarterly conference. My authority is not derived from that certificate of appointment that I just got last week. But my authority is derived from a greater source, a higher source, and not only mine, but yours as well. Do you recognize you have authority? Do you realize that God has empowered you with power that the world can't handle? Reminds me of two elderly women from the South who were sitting in the front pew listening to a fiery preacher. When the preacher condemned sin of stealing, they shouted, Amen, brother. When he preached against the sin of lust, they yelled, Preach it, brother. And 
when he condemned the sin of lying, they jumped up and screamed, right on, brother, tell it like it is. Eh? <laughs> when the preacher condemned the sin of God, two got very quiet. One turned to the other and said, now he can quit preaching and go on the <laughs> Well, Jesus was certainly meddling with the religious leaders. Amen. The phrase, these things, refers to what he did the day before when he tore up the temple by dis disrupting the money changers and knocking over the tables of those selling pigeons and preventing people from using the temple as a shortcut. Also refers to his preaching and his teaching and is no doubt linked to Palm Sunday when the people were giving them hosannas <coughs> to the Son of David. Well, brothers and sisters, the word authority means to have the right and the might to do anything. Yeah, yeah. It, it was self, his self-evident authority that left a mark on the people as seen in Mark chapter 1. It says they were astonished at his teaching. Yeah. For he taught them that one who had authority and not as the scribes. Rabbis commonly quoted the other rabbis when they taught. Jesus didn't need to quote anybody. Amen. Seventy-five times in the gospel, Jesus declared, Truly, truly, I say unto you. Yeah. Yeah. Notice that the religious leaders don't ask why Jesus claimed the temple. Because they knew they were guilty of fleecing the flock instead of feeding the flock. All this merchandising prevented them from living out their mission to take the good news to the Gentiles. They basically, they were basically asking Jesus for his protection and for his source of authority. Brothers and sisters, it's no word that the same group asked Peter and John a strikingly similar question over and at. Yeah. Well, at, the, at, the, well, at the temple after the beggar was healed, they asked, by what power? Yes. Or by what name did you do this? Right. Brothers and sisters, those of us who accept Christ live under such authority. Amen. 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 I love how Jesus quickly demonstrates his authority, not by answering their question. Yeah. Just as he turned the tables over, the day before. Now he turns the table on them. I will ask you one question. Answer me and I'll tell you about what authority I do these things. Jesus is demonstrating the truth of Proverbs, which says, don't answer a fool according to his father. Jesus is not evading or ignoring the question, but is rather revealing what is really in their heart when he asked in verse 30 was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. Did you catch that two times Jesus says, answer me? <laughs> this itself is a demonstration of authority because he's demanding an answer. This phrase is sharp and direct. And they're between a rock and a hard place. They're on the horns of a dilemma. This phrase refers to being impaled by one of two horns of a charging bull. However, they answered, they were going to be bored. They didn't see a good answer to his question. They discussed it with one another, saying, from heaven, if we say he's from heaven, then why don't we believe in him? But if we say he's from man, they were afraid of the people, for the people held John as a prophet. Now here the word discuss means debate, yeah. calculate, to deliberate, to reckon through. No matter how they answered, they were going to be through. Yeah. To say John from heaven is to believe him, but to say he's from men is to betray the people. So in Luke chapter 20, verse 6, we read that they were afraid of getting stoned. They were more concerned about what the people think than what the truth is. How often do we sell the truth 
because we're afraid of what people might think. Since John pointed to Christ, if they affirmed John, they had to accept Jesus. Recall what John said about Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. If they discounted John, they could face condemnation. John MacArthur writes, it's a package deal. You can't take John without Jesus. And you can't throw away Jesus without throwing away John. We learn from Jesus after absorbing the questions we're in position to ask questions. That leads me to the third step. We need to apply a conclusion. Instead of answering, they tap out. Verse 33, they said, we don't know. And Jesus says to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. The answer from the religious authorities makes them seem unofficial and uncertain. Actually, it's not that they didn't know the answer. It's that they didn't have the courage to put the answer in the Word. They don't want to acknowledge the authority of Jesus because those who accept Christ must live under his authority. Amen. Jesus is done talking to them. That's a terrible spot to be in, brothers and sisters, to have Jesus no longer answering you. But because they don't honestly answer his question, he's not going to answer that question. They really don't want to know. So Jesus doesn't engage them any longer. If you refuse to believe the teaching of Jesus, brothers and sisters, there's a point when no further teaching will be given. Grace does indeed have limits. You can't sit around and talk about, I like what Jesus said, I like what Jesus said, and never embrace him. If you don't embrace him, you receive no grace. Shortly before Jesus ascended into heaven, shortly before he took that ride, he commissioned his followers to go with the gospel. Mm -hmm. Most of us are familiar with the verse. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Yeah. Yeah. But let's back up and listen carefully to verse 18. It says, And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And the key to accomplishing the Great Commission is to surrender to Christ's authority in order that you might gain authority. I often heard people share, say that they don't have to share their faith because they don't have the gift of evangelism. I've heard others say they haven't been trained to do so, so they don't share their faith. I've also heard people say they don't want to share their faith because they're afraid they won't have the answer to the questions people ask. Here's what I say to all that. First of all, it's not a gifted issue. This is not about you getting a special gift of evangelism. This is about opening your mouth. Well, we are called to go and to make disciples in the authority of Jesus Christ. Secondly, Training is good, but you don't need training to ask questions. Thirdly, you don't have all the answers, just ask questions. Uh -huh. Amen. Rebecca, excuse me, Rebecca Pipper, in her book, Out of the Salt Shaker, says that good evangelism is 60% asking questions, 30% building intrigue, 10% sharing. I've been reading a book this past week called Questioning Evangelists, Engaging People's Heart the Way Jesus Did. It's written by a man by the name of Randy Newman. And I recommend it to you. Newman recounts two students asking him if he believed everybody who disagreed with him was going to hell. Rather than explaining the nuances of Christian theology, he asked them, if they believed in hell. One of them said he did. Newman then asked if Hitler was in hell. The student replied, of course. 
to which he responded by asking the student, how do you think God decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? Does he grade on a curve? This led to a deep discussion about the nature of God, the pervasiveness of sin, and the offer of forgiveness. His questions made clear that hell was an issue with which everybody needs to grapple. Brothers and sisters, we've been given one job. That's to go tell it. And I know we sing in choirs and we serve on usher boys, but that's not our job. Well, amen. I know we count the money when church has up the nipples and dimes and calculates the outcome. That's not our job. I know we make sure to open up the church in time and Turn on the air conditioning, praise the Lord. Amen. Make sure that seat in the winter time. But that's not our job. We have but one job, and that is to walk in the authority of God, compelling men, women, boys, and girls to come to Jesus. And not later, but come to him great now. We are faced with that every day of our lives. Amen. God has called us to that work. Yes, you look nice in your white uniform, but God didn't call you to that work. Amen. You serve in that capacity, but God did not call you to that work. He may have designed for you to be a part of that work, but that's not the reason why he saved you. He didn't save you to be a member of Phillips Metropolitan CME Church. He didn't save you in order that you might put on your fancy garment and come to church on Sunday looking pristy. <laughs> Amen. God saved you for a purpose, and that was to share the good news of the gospel with those who do not yet know him as Lord. We got one commission. Oh, tell it. Tell it at your home. Tell it on your job. Tell it in the community that you live. Tell it everywhere you go. When God gives you opportunity, you need to tell it. Amen. I've shared with you before how when I first came, I was riding around with Reverend Neal. Every time we came to the toll booth, she was in there talking to the toll taker about the Lord in church. I sit next to her and say, my, my, because what I go through, I just drop the coin. <laughs> but she saw opportunity yeah. and shared her faith. Yeah. Opportunities abound, brothers and sisters, and you do have authority. You do have the power to make a difference in this world. Some of us think all we can do is pray. But prayer is important, but it's not the end. When you get through praying, you got to get up and do it. When you get through saying, Lord, I love you, you got to go out and show it. When you get through saying, Lord, help me make a way, make a way for me, then you got to get up and follow the way that he's made. we got to tell it, brothers and sisters. It's not enough. It's in our poor Lord and we got to tell it. There's still a generation that needs to know that God is still on the throne. There's a generation that needs to know that God is still in the healing business. There's a generation that needs to know that God has power to make a difference in the lives of those who are willing to follow Him. We gotta tell them. It's not for somebody else to do. It's our job. When you get up in the morning, God wants to use you. When you go through your day, God wants to use you. When you hang out with your friend, God, God wants to use you, and He will use. Tell the story. And he's given you authority to do so. Amen. Of course, you can't tell it if you don't have it. You can't share what you don't already love belong. So the first question you need to answer is: Am I committed to Jesus Christ? And if I am committed to him, Will I serve him? And if I'm serving him, then I have got to tell it. How many of you have been saved by grace? You 
got a talent. Yeah. Uh, how many of you have been on a sick bed and God made a way somewhere? Yeah. You got a talent. Yeah. How many of you have been in financial straits and didn't know how you were going to work it out and yeah. it got worked out? Yeah. You got a talent. There's a whole generation that needs to know the Lord is still in the blessing business. The Lord
you leave this place, making your determination that this month, I'm going to approach three people. Now you do your three, the guy's already got his three. Mm, that's right. And he'll make a blessing. Mm. Your life. 